So finally, we're going to talk about sleep and dreaming. The uh, states of sleep are kind of programmed throughout the night uh, and have these 90 minute cycles. And so it's really important to know that, you know, your sleep uh, is organized in these hour and a half uh, time periods. It's really best to have uh, your sleep uh, synchronized so that you wake up in these kind of higher levels, uh, these lighter stages of sleep up here uh, that are characterized by REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. If you're awoken from these deeper stages of sleep, you're more disoriented and, and feel overall more drowsy. So as you fall asleep, you immediately kind of plunge down into this deepest stage of sleep. Um, and that seems to be kind of prioritized early on in the night. Uh, and so it seems like those really slow wave sleep states are very important for uh, the most kind of essential aspects of sleep. 40 hertz is gamma and uh, theta is like, you know, five hertz, roughly speaking, five times a second. And then delta is like one time a second or something very slow. Um, okay, so then you kind of pop out of that stage, go back into this REM cycle. Uh, and the REM you can see gets longer and longer as you go through the night. And so by the time you're kind of, you know, at your later stages when you wake up, often you'll see that you remember your dreams better when you're when you wake up uh, after, uh, you know, a full night of sleep. And if you have time, uh, you're not woken up by your alarm and you're kind of wake up naturally, you may be in this REM sleep uh, and then you kind of naturally arouse from that REM sleep. You know, a lot of people think that the REM sleep is where dreaming happens, but in, in fact, it turns out that you, uh, if you're kind of randomly awoken in these uh, studies um, at these deeper slow wave uh, sleep periods, you also have a 50% chance of being in a dream state. The dream states are kind of less vivid. They're more kind of maybe uh, sort of simpler, um, more perhaps associated with uh, memory encoding is, is what people think now. Um, whereas the REM sleep is kind of more of this kind of florid, crazy, normal, kind of what we think of as, as kind of the most vivid type of dreams. The big question about sleep is why do we sleep, right? What, what's going on? This is crazy waste of time, uh, eight hours every night uh, for adults or whatever, you know, that's like a huge amount of time. Uh, why, why do we need this? Well, the most basic, very solid answer is that sleep is when your body rebuilds. So you use all the infrastructure in your, in your body and your brain during the day. And then, uh, and that kind of breaks down stuff. It's called the catabolic pathway. Um, and then during the night, you kind of rebuild, you recharge. It's just like with your cell phone, you know, you use it, you use the battery down during the day and you plug it in overnight. Uh, right next to where you sleep, probably, and recharge just like what's happening within your body. And so uh, that's absolutely what's happening. And that's why babies, for example, need so much sleep because they're really building, you know, the whole thing uh, from the ground up there, you know, doing a huge amount of uh, this kind of anabolic uh, protein formation and building molecules stages uh, of activity. And so, you know, everything takes energy. It takes energy to build proteins. And so if you're out running around, you know, using your energy kind of while you're awake, then you don't have that much energy available to build up these proteins. And so you kind of need to have the downtime to direct that energy uh, uh, consuming processes towards building up all these proteins. You know, it's like death and taxes. It's just a basic part of, you know, life. You need, you need to have, you've got a finite amount of energy and you need to uh, build up things as well as use them. And so you can't really escape the need for sleep. There's all these stories about people who, you know, theoretically, if you don't get your sleep, you're going to die. Uh, there are some studies with rats that showed a few of the rats dying from something maybe having to do with lack of sleep. But mostly it really is uh, kind of, you know, if you don't sleep, you don't rebuild your body, your immune system gets weak, your, your body gets weak in various ways it's not healthy, okay? And so health is really dependent on sleep. It's not actually going to kill you directly if you don't sleep. Uh, there's been no actual case of like direct death from lack of sleep. It's really indirect effects um, that have a, an effect on your immune system and on your body's overall state. And then that makes you more susceptible to other kinds of uh, ill effects. And so there's really good evidence that getting a solid night of sleep is super important for your health. 
but don't panic because that's one of the downsides of all these things is like now everybody's like, ah, I'm not getting my sleep and now I'm worried about sleeping and I really got to sleep. And that's the worst thing, of course, when you're actually trying to sleep. And so you can have a little bit of like, uh, it's okay. My body's going to take care of itself. Um, it'll do what it needs to do. I can take micro naps. People who have situations where they've had to uh, not get sleep for a long period of time, you see that the body kind of has ways of sneaking in little bits of sleep. And so the body's very tough and you're going to be okay. Uh, but do, if you have the choice and the ability, shape your lifestyle to get more sleep. And exercise is certainly one of the best things that actually triggers that need for rebuilding the body and therefore triggers the basic mechanisms that uh, you know drive the need for sleep in the first place. So exercise is a great way to get more sleep. So one of the effects of sleep then is certainly uh, this effect on uh, having built up all these proteins overnight, that actually changes the synapses. Synapses are uh, one of the places where these proteins are deployed. Um, and so there are a lot of studies showing that we, in fact, do get better uh, forms of memory after a night of sleep because of these kind of protein building uh, effects overnight. The other thing that happens while you sleep is uh, very importantly that your prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain here you can see in purple that it's most deactivated during sleep, okay? And in addition, your amygdala is one of the areas that's most positively activated. And this produces kind of the characteristic features of sleep, okay, and of dreams, which is that you have these uh, random uh, disorganized kind of sequences of events taking place because your frontal cortex isn't there to kind of keep everything on track. And we talked about this a couple of times already. Uh, it's really an amazing way to get uh, subjective access to what it would feel like if you didn't have your frontal cortex. And therefore it kind of tells us a lot about what the frontal cortex is doing for you. Uh, and, uh, and so having that ability to stay on track, stay focused, achieve tasks of uh, you know, everyday life, um, that all depends on having that prefrontal cortex active and keeping you on task. And, and so, yeah, and all the heightened emotionality during dreams, uh, that all is uh, an indication of, of what the amygdala does. And the fact that it's kind of hyperactivated during this time period uh, indicates, you know, kind of what role it's playing there. The effects of those combination of prefrontal cortex and amygdala uh, activity and deactivity um, can produce potentially some important uh, new ways of looking at the world and can help you focus your brain activity on uh, emotionally salient, important uh, events in the world. And so if uh, the, one of the functions of dreaming is to kind of replay the events of the day and to consolidate that understanding, that would kind of make sense. And we actually have a, a new study that suggests that, yeah, in fact, turning off the frontal cortex allows you to make better associations uh, across memories than uh, you otherwise would. In fact, uh, most of the memory research these days is really focusing on the effects of the slow wave sleep, not the REM sleep, for the beneficial effects on memory. And that may, again, be more associated with the protein synthesis processes. So we don't know uh, exactly if dreaming is an epiphenomenon. Certainly sleep in general is, you know, rebuilding. And, and, and if there's patterns of activity while the brain is, is rebuilding, maybe those help guide that process. Maybe they don't that much. Maybe what's guiding that process is all just the events that took place during the day. We know that if we interrupt these sleep stages, they interfere with uh, learning processes. But again, we don't know if the exact content of what's in the dream, you know, what you're actually dreaming about, does that really matter for something that we can measure uh, later on? Uh, finally, uh, the kind of state of hypnosis is really fascinating. It seems like it's related somehow to sort of producing, again, a kind of waking dreamlike state where we're in a highly suggestible kind of uh, state where we're not in full self-control. We're kind of uh, uh, allowing other people to control our brains. And it's just a little bit hard to know uh, in the literature, like how real these things are. Um, people have a certain amount of suggestibility uh, in certain social situations when you have uh, a kind of authority figure. And by creating this, this kind of overall environment where people you know, believe that there is this kind of hypnotic state, 
um, and believe that this person has kind of uh, taken over their brain, uh, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that it, it kind of creates this uh, uh, um, state that people are kind of very suggestible. They're, they are more relaxed. Um, they may have their normal kind of uh, guard mechanisms let down. And so uh, it's really a big debate as to whether, you know, whether it really is like a waking dream state or something more dramatic or whether it's just really some kind of combination of relaxation and this kind of overall normal social uh, kind of forces, again, that we'll talk about a lot in the social chapter. And it really is the case that people are very susceptible to these social influences in the first place, even though we don't really appreciate the extent to which that's true. And so the, the power of hypnosis may be just revealing the extent to which people really are kind of lemmings. We are, really are uh, strongly influenced by others in ways that we don't recognize.